going through the Beatitudes, and, and we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount on Wednesdays, but it, it still flows within my heart even coming on Wednesday. So I'm going to start out with this, because as we are seeking folks to serve diligently right where you are, right where God's called you to be, you work the ground, and it may be rocky ground. It may be hard. In fact, there may be an area of ministry that maybe somebody had already done some plowing. Maybe somebody had already tilled up the ground. Maybe somebody had already even planted some seeds. And maybe it's already a fertile land, and you're just going to step in and take a position that somebody's done a lot of hard work to get it to where it is. Be thankful for all those that has helped get that where it is. But maybe, just maybe, God's calling you to do something and there's never been anything there before. Nobody said it was going to be easy, but we've got to work the ground and till the ground to where we are at. Well, with that said, how do you get it to be fertile? How do you get it to grow, and how do you get it to preserve? Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trotted under the foot of men. It goes on to say that ye are the, the light of the world, and a, and a city that is a, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is a beautiful passage of Scripture, and I have preached this on Sunday mornings. Be salt, be light, make an impact where you are, and make a difference. So tonight, when I look at the opportunities that are out there, no one is more inadequate than us. No one is more adequate than you. No, the devil will say, you can't, you can't, you can't. But you've got to look throughout illustration after illustration all throughout the Bible. God can equip you. God can make a way. And God can uh, take what you think is unusable, and God can use it for his glory. Hey, if he can use a donkey, he can use me. Amen? I mean, he can get glory. And if we don't give him glory, says the rocks a cry out. And as long as I have breath, there will be no rock that will cry out to him. I want you to note that when we see this, there's five things that I want to share with you. Because even though we may feel inadequate about carrying out his commands, remember that he expects of you, his expectations of you are different from what you might think. Uh, you may believe he's looking for charisma. Maybe you're looking for somebody whose persuasiveness and a, a brilliant mind and all the degrees and all those things. While those things are helpful in delivery, he really requires five things for us to do. And I am trying to recruit. I'm praying diligently this month for people to serve, people to step up, not just to fill a blank and not just to fill a bunch of blanks. Feel what God's called you to do. Do what God's called you to do. And I'd rather have someone who's committed than just fill the blank and, and, and not do it. I know it goes against the grain of what everybody else might would think, but I just believe God's called us together as a family, and if God's called us all to be here, God's got a place and a purpose for you. And don't get caught up on looking at everybody's mountaintop and everybody else's peak. Look at where God has you and the ministry work that you've got to do. Well, there's the first thing that I want you to do. How can we do this? First of all, you've got to be, you've got to be sensitive to the Spirit. Be attentive and be obedient to Christ's prompting. How do we do that? Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Not be filled with the spirits, okay? Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with God's Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you what, a, a Holy Ghost-filled individual, oh my goodness, tell me what they can't do with the power of God. Be sensitive to God's leading, and I'm praying for 
God to use you as well as others in this church. Be sensitive to God's leading. So many times we tell God what we want to do and ask Him to bless it. And I'm not saying He can't do that. But boy, it sure is so much more saying, Lord, here I am. Send me, Lord. Guide me, Lord. Let me be sensitive to your Holy Spirit and serve and do what you've asked me to do. There's a second thing. Of course, you've got to be sensitive. Be Holy Ghost sensitive. But there's a second thing, and that is service. I hope and pray that what we do is never glory for ourselves, never for the fact of being patted on the back or everybody likes to be told you're appreciated. Don't, don't get me wrong or... And I think that it's good to say, hey, we sure do appreciate the job that you did. But why do we do what we do? Because if you look for the applause of men, they'll fade. If you look for the pats on the back, they'll let up. But if you do what you do, as though you do it as unto the Lord, do your best. Hey, facts are, isn't he worth it? Isn't he worth our best? Isn't he worth our best effort on a cloudy, dreary Wednesday night? That I promise you that I want to bring the same heart message tonight on a Wednesday message as I do on a Sunday morning message. It's the same God that I'm here to serve and to serve the same people. And I count it a joy to serve you all. I, I, I mean, think about it. You say it's, it's work. But it's, it's a joy to serve, and it's a joy to serve Him. And when you serve others, you're serving it not as unto serving just them. I'm doing it as though we are serving unto the Lord. If we would do that, I'm going to tell you what, you'll get greenery around you. You'll see growth come up around you. We'll, we'll see health come up. James 4.10 says this, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Wow. When you humble yourself, the Bible says I must decrease so that he can increase. First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Uh, it's, it's for him, and the more you do it for him, the more it, it lifts you up. It's weird how it works, but it does. Matthew 23 and 12 says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Folks, just remember, be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and do the work as you're doing it unto the Lord. There's a third thing that I want to share with you tonight. Not only do we have sensitivity, we have service, but it's a sacrifice. You all took time. You all take time. We do what we do, not for monetary gain. We do it for the Lord. And so pour yourself out for Christ's namesake rather than what you can attain. Don't do it to get, do it to get. I'm not doing it to get, I'm doing it because I've already got. And I know I'm using the term I, but when you think of that, do it in your terminology. You're not doing it to get, you're doing it because you've already got. The world doesn't understand that. But Romans 12, 1, 2 says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed, and transform means changing. Um, just that transformation that takes place, and you have to be like that ball of clay on the potter's wheel and let him work out and take out any impurities, any hard knots, any bad spots. And you all have ever seen those on the potter's wheel and as they're pumping that wheel and getting their hands wet and shaping and molding that clay and just getting in and they're working it out and getting out all the, all the impurities and things. It's being transformed and it's being kneaded and, and, and processed and God is the potter and we are the clay. And if we would just allow him to mold us, 
man, it's amazing. He can take it and use it in some amazing ways. There's a fourth thing I want to share with you tonight. Not only do we got to be sensitive, not only do we have to um, look at it as, as we're doing it as a service unto the Lord, not only is it a sacrifice because you've got to be willing to give up, you've got to be in self-denial. You say, well, isn't that sacrifice? Luke 9, 23 says, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Similar to sacrifice, but the emphasis is on seeking Christ's kingdom instead of seeking yours. Um, I'm more interested in seeing kingdom growth than I am just even local growth. And you say, I don't understand that. I want people to be where God is calling them to be. It's not self-centeredness, but I'm praying that people would go and serve and serve Him to the fulfillment the best they can. I, I know I've used this illustration on numerous occasions, but um, my friend Michael Hawkinsmith, I mean, he was my right hand. Everything, all that I did, he was always right there. And I'll never forget seeing God was doing something mighty in his life, and I could only take him so far. In fact, his wife needed to be able to be trained and helped as well. And I told Susan one day, and I said, I'm, I believe uh, Mike's got a call, and I believe that they need to go to Clear Creek. And she said, I thought the exact same thing. When I went to them and presented them with the idea, they wasn't as happy and thoughtful about it as much as I was. And it's not, you know... Um, uh, mama called and daddy sent. That's not what I'm talking about, not the call. When I talked to Mike and Angela about going to Clear Creek, they thought we're doing all these things right here, and I didn't want them to leave. It had been selfish. I wanted them to stay. I didn't. How was we going to get all this stuff done if they didn't stay? But I knew I couldn't take them to the level that they wanted to. And he said, are you trying to get rid of us? And I said, absolutely not. I'd be a nut if that's what I was thinking. But I believe God's doing something in your life, and I see that, and it would be wrong on my part to hold you back or to keep you from doing what is clearly evident God is leading you to go and to do. And once he understood what was happening, he was, he was ingrained. He was working where he was, but God was leading him to do something even more. And I'm, I'm mindful of that. So be self-denying. Don't do it to build yourself up or your own little kingdom. Do it to build up the kingdom of God. Well, I got a fifth one for you. It's hard. It's a short sermon tonight. But suffering. You're saying, ugh. Why, why are we going there? Why why'd you have to go there? Following Christ and following Him obediently, even when it means pain and persecution, knowing that you are serving Christ and His eternal purposes. Now, why would I place this one at the last of the list? I gave you five things, and the last one I gave you was suffering. Why would I do that? Well, you, you may say, Brother Jason, you, you, um, why don't you put something more positive as your final point? Don't you, supposed to, don't you supposed to know that you're supposed to start out and then build up to a peak and then put us to work? You're ending here with something is suffering. Why would you do that? Don't you want people to come back on every Wednesday night? I, I do. But, folks, the, the bottom line is, is that I'm preaching and preaching with all of my heart and getting people to serve and to serve with all their heart. If I have to mislead you, don't, don't, wouldn't you love it if you found an honest salesman? Wouldn't you love it if somebody just told you about the product and told you genuinely about the product and just said, you know, I don't want to mislead you. I don't know a whole lot about this used car here. I really don't. I don't know about the transmission. I don't know about how hard it's been driven. It was only driven by a little lady who drove it to church on Sunday. That's what I know. Isn't that what the come along mentality is? And often when you see a salesman, that's kind of the way they come across. They act like they know everything that there was about it. And the fact is, I'd rather be honest with folks. And I think honesty is always the best policy and just tell you it's not always going to be easy. In fact, church is not always going to be easy. And, and, and when we think about this, because I, I want us to think about it in the truth, and you don't often experience suffering in the beginning. You, you, nobody goes into something with the mindset of failure. 
we all should be entering in that this is going to succeed. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do my position. I'm going to serve this thing well, and it's going to go off without a hitch. We're just going to run it, and it's going to go good. And what I find is sometimes people start out with that mindset, and the first time that something happens or first time something doesn't go just right, well, that was a bust. I quit. I'm done. That didn't work. I'm over it. And folks, God didn't call us to give up. God didn't call us to quit. I understand everybody needs a breath and a break. I, I understand that too. But at, understand that if you're going to get into a fight, you're going to get punched and you're going to get hit. You have to be able to give as well as take. And, and that's what... The Lord knows happens in the spiritual aspect of it. Romans 5, verses 3 and 5 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. 1 Peter 5.10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, he, he makes you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settles you. Roman, or James verses 1, 2, and 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. How do you count it a joy when, when you hear of folks getting COVID? How do you count it a joy when you hear of sickness that's going around? How do you count it a joy when you hear about a flood that happened? I, I don't like the fact that we've had flood. I don't like the fact that we've had sickness. But do you know how many people are moving in to eastern Kentucky right now to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't like the, what happened. God didn't want the flood no more than us. I mean, it's what, you know, say, why did God allow that to happen? God knew that it was going to happen, yes, of course. But, but through this, even through the disasters and, and the pains of this world, the ministry can go forward. And, and I think about that. Count it a joy, even when you fall into divers temptations, even when things are hard. Romans 18, 8 says, For I reckon, see, that's country talk. It's written right there in the Bible. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Folks, sometimes we get so thought up, uh, th thoughtful on just the things of around us as being success. But, you know, the Bible says, Store up your treasures in heaven. Do good. Do a good work. Do it diligently. And do it as unto the Lord. I used to have a professor at Clear Creek. And whenever you would open the door for him or you would do something like that, he'd walk by and he'd, he was an older, older gentleman. He'd, wa he'd walk and he'd say, put a jewel in your crown, you know, and he'd walk on. I thought, what do you mean? What do you mean? Later on, I figured out what he's talking about. You know, put a jewel in your crown. We sing a song, crown him with many crowns. And what is the jewel in the crown? What does this mean? We will crown him with many crowns. Uh, it's not for my glory, for the things here are temporal, but the things that we do, we lay at his feet and we do it as unto the Lord, the things that we do for others. Well, tonight, what's the takeaway? What are these verses saying? is that the Savior wants us to use our life as a platform to display His power. I'm going to read that again because I really had to think about that. What these verses are saying is that the Savior wants to use your life as a platform to display His power. And would you allow Him to display His power through you? Would you get plugged into a place? Would you get plugged into an area of service and say, Lord... I can't, but here I am. And if you'll be the current that will drive me and push me and help me, I'll do it. I'll do it. So when he calls, don't worry about whether you're smart, talented, beautiful enough, although you all are. Look and just think about, Lord, you've got us. And because I know it's yours, it's all going to work out. Just obey him and obey him wholeheartedly. You'll be able to reach the peak of the mountain where you're at, and it will grow green. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we have many things that we've brought in here tonight. It's a Wednesday night feast to be able to dive into your word. And Lord, we're thankful to be able to do that. We are a, we are a church 
a body of believers that is first and foremost just wanting to do your will. And we are praying for the saints. We're praying, Lord, for brothers and sisters so that we can work together and work together diligently, edifying them, lifting them up, and encouraging brothers and sisters to carry forth the good name of Jesus Christ. You are worthy, Lord. You're worthy of it all. And we're going to tell you thank you for what you're doing on the front end because we know what you're going to do on the back. Lord, this whole thing, this whole church, every position, everything that we do, let us not make it about us. Let's make it about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.